Amen. All right. Who came here? I just want to see a show of hands. Who came here because you wanted God to change your life? Amen. Amen. All right. He's been here three years in a row, and every time he speaks, there, there is a hush that comes across the field house. And God has used this man um, in great and mighty ways. He comes from Virginia. He's been a youth pastor for a long time. He travels a lot and speaks at camps and everything like that. This is one of his favorite places he likes to come to. Let's give him a big converge welcome, Chip Dean. Hey, Converge, how are we doing tonight? Make some noise. It is so good to see you. It is great to be back in Lava, Ohio with you, worshiping Jesus together. Y'all go ahead and take a seat right now if you can. So it's been about a year since I've seen you, and since last year, as of three weeks ago, I praise God, I have become a daddy. My wife and I have adopted a little baby girl. She is three weeks old. Her name is Brooklyn Rose, and we are just so thankful to have her. It is so good to be back. I love being at Converge every year. This is where we get to see the Spirit of God poured out. This is where we get to see Jesus work. This is where we get to see God raise up a generation of teenagers. If you believe that God's going to speak to you tonight, make some noise right now. Let me hear you. I want everybody to put your arm around somebody right now. Everybody put your arm around somebody, and I want us to pray together. You've heard a lot of people pray. I want to encourage you to pray. Nothing of eternal significance, a preacher once said, nothing of eternal significance happens outside of the power of prayer. If you want to see God move, you pray. If you want to hear God speak, you pray. If you want God to forgive you, you pray. If you want God to transform you, you pray. If you want God to save somebody, you pray. Nothing outside of eternal significance happens outside of the power of prayer. With every arm around somebody right now, I just want to encourage you just to go ahead and pray for them out loud. You can even take turns just for the next few seconds each. Just take about 15 seconds each. Pray out loud for one another, and I'll pray, and we'll get started. Pray right now. Let's go. Heavenly Father, we love you, and God, I pray right here, right now, tonight, that your spirit would be so strong in this place. God, I ask that Jesus would speak to every heart in this room. Father, I beg you that we would not leave here the same, but God, that we would be changed, not because of just a decision we've made, not because we're going to try harder not just because that maybe we've been convicted, but God, I pray that we would be changed because of the work that your Spirit does in our hearts that we could never do to our own selves. God, we ask you in Jesus' name, God, that you would raise us up tonight to be followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, that we can go and reach this world for him through the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. Converge, you may have heard me say a couple years ago that probably the scariest moment in my life was when I went through a tornado. I will never forget April 11, I'm sorry, April 27 of 2011, where F, F1 tornadoes ripped through my neighborhood. Now, tornadoes go up to about EF5. F1 are like kindergarten-sized tornadoes, I've told you before. I can remember looking outside my window and watching two tornadoes come through my neighborhood. My backyard fence get lifted out of the ground, a trampoline flying through the air over my house, me screaming like a middle school girl in the most embarrassing way imaginable, 
And the next thing I remember, I find myself in my bathtub with a mattress on top of me while I am grabbing, I'm grasping my MacBook Pro with my mommy on the phone, and I'm 30 years old. And I remember screaming to my mom as I can hear the roof ripping off my house, Mom, I love you, and I will see you in heaven. I lived. I went on to see the next day, and our town was shut down for a week. I will never forget coming to church the next week and hearing from one of our teenagers by the name of Danae. Danae came up and told me the story. During that same tornado, as the same tornado, I'm sorry, actually one of the larger tornadoes that day, comes ripping through her neighborhood, the EF5, that her dad began to panic, which she had never seen him panic before. And he was commanding his family to get down into the basement because a tornado was ripping through their neighborhood. Danae said, I've got to go up and get my shoes first. And he took Danae and he grabbed her and he carried her down the stairs at the same time. The tornado hit their home. And Danae said, my dad jumped on top of me, landed on top of me, while our chimney came caving down, landed on top of him. She said it took about 45 seconds for the tornado to pass by. And she said, when all was said and done, all that was left of my house was rubble. And my dad was on top of me, and the chimney was on top of him, and he was dead. She said she had to lay there for four hours until someone found her and rescued her from that situation. Now I get to watch Danae as she is traveling the world, and I wish I could hear her conversations, because I can't imagine what the stories that she would tell about the man who risked his life so that she could live, the man who went through death so that she could have life, the man who went through the torment and agony of pain so that she could have a future. And in a world of fatherlessness, where so many people say, I wish I had a dad who loved me. I wish I had a dad who cared about me. I wish I had a dad who noticed me. I wish I had a dad who would talk to me. I wish I had a dad who would sacrifice his time for me. I wish I had a dad that would sacrifice his life for me. Danae got to have that type of experience, but listen to me tonight. Because this is the most important part of your life. This is one of the most important things that you will ever hear that will identify you, that will define you, that you will be able to live your life from, that you will be able to live your life by. If you do not get this, then you will experience depression. If you will not, if you don't get this tonight, then you will experience hopelessness. Then you will not get what your life is all about and where you get hope and where you get joy and where you get peace and where you get love. See, here is the end of the story. Every one of us has had a man who has given his life for us and his name is Jesus and he's our Savior. And his name is Jesus and he's our Lord. And I believe that Jesus is worth living for. I believe, I believe that that man, not only, not only is Jesus worth living for, I believe, listen to me right now, and everybody look at me in the eyes as I'm looking you in the eyes here right now, because Converge is different. This is not just some conference to entertain teenagers. This is not just some conference to get you off the streets. This is the most prayed for conference that I ever get to be a part of. This is a conference that is desperate for Jesus to show up and the Holy Spirit to move. So I'm telling you here tonight, I'm going to take a different direction than what I normally take in conferences such as these, and I want to share with you the most moving, 
passage of Scripture in all the Bible, and I want you to know it is not going to be entertaining. It is not going to be funny. It is not necessarily going to be attention-getting. This is a passage of Scripture that I pray that God arrests your attention, that you drown out all of the temptations of the evil one, like the Bible says, when the gospel is sown, that birds or demons come and try to snatch the seed away, that he would try to distract you with your phone, that he would try to distract you with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or just a best friend sitting beside you. But this is going to be the most important message of your life that you have heard yet. I want to teach you tonight, and I want, you, I want to tell you the story tonight of how Jesus died for you because here's what we need to understand. We won't be willing to live for Jesus unless we are willing to die for Jesus. We will not be willing to live for Jesus unless we are willing to die for Jesus, but please hear me. We will not be willing to die for Jesus without our understanding that he died for us first. Here we go. Check it out. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And by the way, warning, tonight will be graphic. It will be gross. It will be gruesome. But the point is not to make anyone sick or not to gross anyone out. The point is to understand the depth of what Jesus did for our sin. The story picks up in Matthew chapter 27, verse 21, which says this, The governor again said to them, said to the people, This is a scene at the courthouse where all of the Jews, where all of the people of the town had gathered around. And he's, th this governor said, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? See, there was this, uh, this, this prisoner at the time, as you may have heard before, his name was Barabbas. We know that Barabbas was a dangerous man. We know that Barabbas was a terrible man. He was a murderer. Barabbas was someone that you would never want loose in your city. Barabbas, he was, he was a man that his, his mind was mad. He was crazy. There was no telling what he would do. They had finally captured him and, and locked him up. But now comes the day where, where they're going to release someone. It's between Barabbas and Jesus. It is between this man who is a murderer and the Messiah. Which of these do you want me to release for you? And, they, and the people cried out, release Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And the people said, let him be crucified. And Pilate said to the people, why? What, is, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. And we read things like that in the scriptures converge. And we wonder, what was wrong with them today? How could they have possibly wanted Pilate, the governor, to release a murderer, to release a crazy man within the city? But instead, they said, why don't you release Barabbas and you crucify, you kill Jesus, this peacemaker, the one who calls himself the Messiah, the one who has healed people, the one who has loved people, the one that has brought value into people's lives. And I need you to understand, they are not crazy. They are just like us. Because every single day when I, when you, when we choose to sin, we're saying, God, release my sin, but kill him. God, I want to sin. I want to live however I want to, I want to live. I want freedom. I want autonomy. God, I want, to, I want to explore my sexuality. God, I want to take what's, what's not mine. God, I want to spread hate through the world. God, I want to rebel against my parents. God, I want, to, I want to make life about me. God, I want to sin. God, would you lock up Jesus? I don't want to live for him. 
I want to live for me and what I want to do with my life. See, we've got to understand that every decision to sin is a decision to kill Jesus on the cross because that's what led Jesus to the cross. Matthew 27, verse 34 I'm sorry, verse 24. So when Pilate, said, when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, Pilate went and took and washed his hands with water before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people answered, His blood be on us and be on our children. And they had no idea how true that was. Here's what they were saying. Let Jesus' death, Jesus of Nazareth, let his death be responsible to us. We're responsible for killing him. Pilate, you don't have to wash your hands of this matter. Pilate, it is our decisions. Let his blood be on us. Let us be the ones who are responsible for him. See, who is truly responsible for Jesus' death? Please hear me. The Romans were responsible for Jesus' death legally. The Jews were responsible for Jesus' death religiously. But we, humanity, you and me, what we're about to read, you need to hear me. We are responsible because we're sinners. And ultimately Jesus did not die because he was condemned to death. Ultimately Jesus died because he laid down his life for us. He did it willingly. His father sent him to the cross because it was the only way that we could live. Verse 25, so Pilate released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now, having scourged Jesus are three little Words that have so much meaning to our faith, that have so much meaning to our life. What that word scourged means is the intense agony and pain and torture and torment that Jesus went through for us. That word scourged is talking about when they would walk around and they would spit on Jesus. And the Roman guards would punch him in the face as hard as they could. And they would say, which one just hit you, Jesus, Messiah of Nazareth? And it said that they would take their, their huge Roman guard hands and grab his beard and rip the hair out of his face. We're seeing here the hatred that sin has for Jesus. And the Bible says that they took that crown of thorns Spikes, thorns that were three to four inches long and they would put it on his head and they would dig it into his brow and into his temple and into his scalp where blood would be gushing down his face and gushing down the back of his head and the sides of his face. And the, the Bible says then that they would take this torturous apparatus that they called the cat of nine tails. It was a handle that had a, a leather strap on it. It would have these nine different ends on it that would, they would have these, these tiny metal balls, metal hooks, animal bones, shards of glass, stones that had been sharpened. And when they would whip it, the metal balls would first fly through the air and hit the human flesh in order to tenderize the flesh so that then the hook and the bone and the glass could dig into a human being's flesh. And the Bible says, and historians tell us, that it would latch in so deep that it would take the strength of a Roman guard to pull it back out. And history would tell us that you would see not only blood, but you would see skin and muscle and even pieces of bone with some of these prisoners that would be lashed with the cat of nine tails. And we know that Jesus went through this. Please hear me. Jesus went through this 
because this is what our sin deserved. Jesus did not just go through this to show us how much he loved us. While that is true, Jesus is going to the extreme of showing us that he would do anything in order to have relationship with us, anything in order to have us in heaven with them, anything in order to show his love toward us, anything to be able so that we could receive him as our Savior and Lord. While that is true, God is showing us what our sin deserves, the things that I've done in my life against him, my pride, my lust, my issues, the way that I have desired materials over God, possessions and money, the way that I have sinned against him and not lived his way but lived my own. It says that they scourged Jesus, they whipped him some 39 times with the cat of nine tails, and they beat Jesus to a bloody pulp. And it was a, such a near-death experience. Verse 27, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and this is where they put a scarlet robe on him where I mentioned they twisted together a crown of thorns they put it on his head they put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him they mocked him saying hail king of the Jews as I mentioned before they spit on him they took the reed and struck him on the head and when they had mocked him they stripped him of the robe and put his clothes on him and they led him a way to crucify him. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing how they mocked Jesus. We're seeing how they shamed Jesus. We're seeing how they put all of this guilt on Jesus, where they made fun of Jesus. See, a lot of times we will live our lives for Jesus. We'll do crazy things for Jesus. We will sing for Jesus. We will go on mission trips for Jesus. We will go out and love Lama for Jesus. We will come to conferences for Jesus. We'll wake up on Sunday morning and we'll go to church for Jesus. But normally where our boldness for Jesus stops is where people make fun of us. Is where people mock us. Is where people shame us. And here is one of the most beautiful parts of the gospel. You can have confidence and boldness when people mock you and shame you and throw guilt on you for believing in Jesus because Jesus was mocked and he was shamed for your name so we can be mocked and we can be shamed for his name. Amen? And we have got to go through that for him. It says here, in verse 32, that they went out and they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry the cross of Jesus. Matthew doesn't tell us, but the other gospel writers also include that for a ways that Jesus carried his cross. Jesus carried his cross beam. Can you imagine Jesus having been beaten within an inch of his life? to a bloody pulp, to where he was almost dead. And then they put a cross beam on his back that weighs upwards to about a hundred pounds. And they made him walk for about a mile until he collapsed and he could not walk anymore. And so this man Simon of Cyrene came up and carried his cross for him. In verse 34, they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall but when Jesus tasted it he would not even drink of it this is amazing to me they're offering Jesus this wine mixed with gall what that drink is and I had to study this I had to look this up and do a little research on it what that drink is is a pain reliever it is a painkiller. It is what they would drink when people were going through intense pain. When it came to sickness, disease, and death, they would give that to them in near-death experiences to, to basically not be able to even feel the pain to put them out of their misery. But Jesus wouldn't drink the pain reliever because he wanted to go through every ounce of pain for our sin. 
He wanted to experience it all. The Bible talks about it as he wanted to drink all of God's wrath for our sin. Jesus did not want to skip out on any of it. He wanted to experience every single bit of it. Verse 39, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple, rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. See, when they nailed Jesus to the cross, often we are told that they put the nails through his hands. That is not true. They tell us, historians tell us, that actually the Roman executioners would put nails through the man's wrist. See, dying by crucifixion was only saved for the worst of criminals. It was actually a very public event. They would do it in, in, in this public place, often near a marketplace where people go and shop, so that adults and children could see the men and women crucified on these crosses because it was a deterrent saying, if you live like them, then you will die like them. And so they would do it in this very public place, and they would only do it with the worst of criminals. But only the extreme worst of criminals, those who did the absolute worst deeds to society is when they would not just use the ropes, but they would use the nails. And so when they placed the nails in Jesus' wrist and pierced his wrist with that nail through the hammer, what would happen is he would have tendons that would tear that he would not be able to use his arms. So that when he put his feet together and they put one nail through his feet on the cross, he would not be able to use his legs, but he would only be able to use his back, to be able to arch his back just to get a breath. And Jesus had already bled so much. Jesus had already bled out nearly every single drop of blood that when he goes on the cross and they are mocking him and they are making fun of him and he's a bloody mess, and Jesus is tormented and he's in pain and the Bible says that he's crying out. But still there are people who are pointing their finger and they're shaming him. And they're telling him, you're a fake. You're a liar. You're not the real Messiah. You've come and you're a blasphemer. Why don't you take yourself down off the cross if you're the real God? Why don't you save yourself? Why don't you do something to prove yourself? But all along, Jesus was proving that what God would truly do is not save himself, but he would hang on the cross and he would go through every last ounce of pain for our sin all the way unto his death. And the Bible says that as they're mocking him, verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Jesus had hung in that kind of agony and pain for three hours. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, you've turned your back on me. We've always been tight. We've always been close. I've always been in your presence. God, I've always been your only begotten son. God, I've always been your beloved one. But God, this is the first time, Father, this is the first time that I'm looking to heaven and you've turned your back on me. Why have you forsaken me? 
This quote comes from Psalm chapter 22. In Psalm chapter 22, it starts the exact same way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, what would happen is the way that they would lead worship back in these, these days of the people of Israel is that someone would begin the line of a psalm such as, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And because the Jewish people would have memorized that entire psalm, they would only have to say the first line, and then everyone else would sing the rest of the psalm. And what Jesus is doing with Psalm chapter 22 is he's identifying himself because Psalm 22 is all about this suffering servant. Psalm 22 is all about this Messiah who would die. Psalm 22 is all about the one who would say, I will give up my life for the sin of the people. And here is the most amazing part of it all. Jesus was forsaken by his father. At, during his death on the cross so that when we believe in Jesus, God will never forsake us. Think about this. Jesus died for every one of your sins. There is not one of your sins that has not been forgiven if you've given your life to Jesus, which means there's nothing you can do for God to forsake you. There's nothing you can do for God to turn his back on you. There is nothing you can do for God to forget you, for God to cast you out, for God to quit on you. God has promised if he has forsaken his son, then you've already been forsaken in Christ. And now that Jesus is accepted, you will be accepted forever. It's amazing. So often I fear that today teenagers quit on God because they think that God has quit on them. See, the reality is this. Knowing the truth that God will never forsake us, that God will never leave us, that God will never turn his back on you, that God will always be there to forgive you, that God will never quit on you, that God will never leave you alone, that God will always pursue you, that God will always love you, that God will always forgive you. I don't know about you, but knowing that truth, that does not make me want to take advantage of God. That does not make me want to take God for granted. That does not make me say, oh, great, well, that means I get to sin all I want. If that is our heart, then we are unsaved. But knowing that Jesus will never quit, knowing that God will always forgive, knowing that we will never be forsaken, what that does in me is says, God, if you will never forsake me, if you will always forgive me, then I want to go all out for you. Then I want to do everything I can for you because I don't want to take that lightly. Verse 47, and some of the bystanders heard it and said, this man is calling Elijah, and one of them is at once ran, ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. Historians tell us that these sponges, as gross and as sickening as this is, were used in public restrooms for when people would use the restroom, when people would use the bathroom, and this is what they would use to clean themselves up, which means somebody ran and got a dirty sponge and put it on a pole and lifted it to Jesus. And that was the last smell the last taste that our Savior experienced on this earth before his death. That was the type of dishonoring that our Jesus Christ went through. But others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Jesus died. The Son of God died. He went through death 
for us. He died for you. You were on his mind. You were in his heart. Please listen to me as this is extremely important. How did Jesus die? Scientists tell us, doctors tell us that the human body is filled with about five liters of blood, somewhere around a gallon. And, and historians tell us, even the Bible talks about how Jesus bled every drop of blood out to where all that was left in his body was water so that when they pierced him with the edge of a spear, that all that came out was blood and then water. How did Jesus die? It looks like what happened was Jesus' body went through so much trauma, so much pain, so much torment, in so much agony that it is probably the case that the sack around his heart, which was filled with fluid, exploded, which caused a heart attack, which meant that Jesus died of a broken heart for you and for me. Jesus went to the cross willingly for you and for me. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for our sake... God made him who knew no sin to become our sin so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. Jesus became our sin. When Jesus died on the cross, he took all of your sin and all of my sin and bore it on his body and said everything that Chip has ever done Everything that they have ever done, I am dying for that. And he took our sins so he could give us his righteousness. But here's where I want to end, and here's what I want you to see. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. And behold, when Jesus died, the curtain of the temple of the tabernacle was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Here's the whole point of Jesus' death. The Bible says when Jesus died, as there was this massive earthquake and there was darkness all over the earth, there was something very specific, very important, very urgent, very significant that happened. The Bible says that there was this, this massive four-inch thick curtain that, that was a shield around this room in the temple that only the high priest could go into once a year. And that room was called the Holy of Holies. And that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was where the throne of God was. And that was where the smoke and the fire would come down out of heaven, the presence of God, and fill the temple so that people could see that God was the true God of Israel and the true God of the whole world. And people could not get into the Holy of Holies. People could not get into the presence of God. People could not experience God on a personal basis then. But until Jesus died, the Bible says not just that a man came or a priest came or a prophet came and tore the veil. The Bible says that it was torn from top to bottom, which means God took his hands and tore the veil so that you you could come in and so that I could come in so that we can know God so that we can know him personally in college I had a friend by the name of Dan Dan all he talked about was how much he loved to surf Danny, he, he, he talked about how just that he, he wanted to go pro and he had all these sponsors that wanted to sponsor him in his life and, and, and he had all these surfing posters and all these surfing clothes and his surfboard was always in the corner of his, of his college dorm room and Dan would not shut up about surfing. That's all he talked about was surfing, surfing, surfing all the time and how he was in college in Pennsylvania with us and there wasn't any, any ocean around anywhere close and he couldn't surf and how bummed he was because he, would never, he could never surf. Well, finally, Dan's birthday rolls around and my buddy Eric wants to surprise him. 
And he says, Chip, here's what I'm going to do. For Dan's birthday, I'm going to take him early in the morning. I'm going to put him in the car, and he's not going to know. It's going to be a big surprise. I'm going to drive him six hours down the road to Ocean City, Maryland, and I'm going to take him surfing because he won't shut up about surfing. So finally, Dan's birthday rolls around. Eric doesn't tell him what's up, throws Dan in the car. Dan's asking the whole way, what are we doing, what are we doing, what are we doing? Finally, six hours down the road, they get to Ocean City, Maryland. Eric pulls up to a surf shop. He turns to Dan. He said, bro, guess what? You've been talking about it every day since we've known you. Today, I am taking you surfing for your birthday. And Dan looked at Eric and, say, and he said, I don't feel like surfing today. And Eric looked at Dan with his mouth dropped open, wide eyes bug-eyed, and knew exactly what he meant. He had been lying the whole time. Dan was a fake. Dan was a liar. Here's my question. It's so easy to come to conferences. It's so easy to worship with a band. It's so easy to be a part of a youth group, to be in a chapter. It's so easy to go on church on Sundays. But here's my question for you, and please hear my heart in this, is I love you and that God loves you and he's proven his love for you. Have you ever surfed? God tore the veil God sacrificed his son. God did the most extreme act, and Jesus died the most extreme death. Here's my question for you. Have you really given your life to him? Have you ever experienced the presence of God in your life? Have you ever experienced the joy of forgiveness? Have you ever sacrificed your sleep and said, I'm going to stay up and I'm going to pray? I'm going to get up early every